Welcome to the Locke Miller Lecture um, on Art History. Um, the Locke Miller Lecture was endowed by a former professor, Carlotta Locke Miller, in memory of her father, David Locke Miller, um, who was past president of the University of Tennessee and um, had a great interest in art and art history. So um, <clears throat> we want to thank her and I want to welcome our guest today, Dr. Indira Bailey. Um, she has a PhD in art education and women's gender and sexuality studies from the Pennsylvania State University. She's currently at Claflin University in Orangeburg, South Carolina, where she serves as assistant professor of education. And hopefully I didn't mangle my introduction too badly. Um, Dr. Bailey, it's all yours. Thank you. It's art education. <laughs> I, did I say art education? I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. art education. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me for the Locke Miller Art History Series um, at East, Eastern Central University. And uh, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Let me just put that down. Okay. So, welcome. I'm glad to see you here this afternoon. And in this presentation, I will discuss this concept of the Black feminist movement and contemporary Black women artists and how they receive the inspiration and locate this, their self and their artwork and art practice. So, I'm an artist, I am an art educator, and I'm a researcher. And for 16 years, I taught art education at a high school in New Jersey. I am a professional artist for over 20 years, and as stated earlier, I am an assistant art education professor at Clapton University in South Carolina. So this presentation, originally this presentation was my inquiry about the Black feminist movement, and I wanted to know, um, as a, a Black female artist, what type of support network was offered to women? Because I knew in the 1970s there was a movement for Black women artists and there was a support community, but I felt that I didn't have that now. And I wanted to know, did it exist? What happened? And I interviewed several women um, artists to find out their, their inspiration, to find out what did they think about Black feminism? What did they think about the Black feminist movement? And they varied from throughout the United States and different levels in their career. Some of the women were um, there during the 1970s, some were born during the 1970s, some were children in the 1970s, and some were not born then. So it was a great experience to, to hear their reflections and what they thought about black, femin black, black feminism and how did that apply to their artistic practice. So I'm just going to go over a little bit about the Black Feminist Movement. So the Black Feminist Movement came about in the early 1970s to confront sexism and racism and inequality in, with museums and art galleries. The issues that were unique to Black women experiences. And in doing so, the Black Feminist Movement gave Black women artists a community of support so they can voice their concerns which the feminist art movement did not, which was white dominated, and the black arts movement did not address because that was black male dominated. There was no one definition for black feminism that everyone could agree upon. And most people will say that the definition is subjective. But one thing that is, um, that stays in the category that's all black women, are, not art kids, artists have experienced is inequality. And I'm a, at the bottom, you see a quote by Betty Saar. It says, we were invisible to museums and in gallery scenes. So regardless of what people called themselves, that was still an issue and a main topic that Black women had. Well, in the 1970s, the Black feminist art movement did help some Black women. Um, it, it helped them to, to achieve recognition. It helped their art career. But the Gorilla Girls have responded to the June 2015 Art News Magazine, and I'll quote, now the bias is more coded. Tokenism shown the same few women or artists of color over and over is this a huge distraction. So what they started to see was, yes, you saw more women of color in museums and galleries, but usually it was the same person. So tokenism did not, was, 
a sort of appeasement to say, oh, we have one already. But in reality, it still held back a lot of black women artists. This did not demonstrate inclusion or diversity. So the Kambahi River Collective made a statement, a black feminist, a feminist statement in 1974. And they said, defining black feminism as the logical political movement to combat manifold and simultaneously oppression of all women of color. As the movement involved, so did the definitions of black feminism. And black feminist Patricia Hill Collins said not to get too tied up with how we are defining ourselves. Black feminism, womanism, Afro Afrocentric feminism, Africana womanism, the importance is the need for the discussion to have a common ground. And that common ground was the lack of visibility and opportunities for black women artists. Faith Ringel was a pioneer in the black feminist art movement. She demanded that women's, black women's work and women of color's work be taken seriously. <clears throat> she described a rejection that she received when she walked into a gallery to show her artwork. And the gallery owner said to her, do you know where you are? Ringo replied, yes. The gallery owner told her, you, she said, placing the stress on the word you, cannot do this. I knew what she meant. Ringgold knew that her color and her gender was an issue. And I was avoiding her to show her artwork in mainstream galleries and museums. In order to understand the dynamics of the black feminist movement from the 1970s to the present, I'm gonna show you several different artists and how they move past the obstacles and the boundaries of being a black woman artist today. I found this, this story similar to some of my own experiences, and I find the successes and challenges correlated with the artwork that they created. So the first artist I wanna show you is Janet Taylor Pickett. Janet was born in 1948 in Ann Harbor, Michigan, and she received her BFA and her MFA from the University of Michigan School of Art and Design. She is currently a retired art professor and she taught art history and studio art for 35 years in New Jersey, and she currently lives in California. Janet was aware of the Black feminist movement in the 70s. She was an art student at the time, and she felt that Black feminist art movement today is mostly in literature and mainstream media, but feels that there is a need for one today because Black women are still put on the background. Janet recalls after graduating from art school in the, 19, in the early 1970s, she was taught to hit the pavement and show her work, and she was eagerly to do so. And she talked about an experience when she went to one art gallery. It is certainly not easy, especially for African-American females back then. I remember tracking around the city with slides, in the, with slides back in the day and going into galleries cold. I remember dropping off these slides, looking back, and having the woman drop my slides in the garbage. And she talked about how she felt the shock that she felt as the person did that. And she, of course, what could she do? She walked out, but just the feeling of you're being rejected because of your skin color. Okay. This is one of her paintings that we had talked about. And she describes her artwork as being a vessel of, of expressionism. And this is called Still, A Still Life Number One, which is a photograph of a black female domestic worker. Janet calls this a still life because the woman in the artwork, life stopped because she was trapped in domestic work. The expressionism on, the, on her face tells the story of oppression. Janet explains, if you wanna call this a feminist stance, then that's what it is. This is how Janet locates the meaning of her work. I am a woman. I'm a woman of a particular ancestry. That ancestry is rooted in this history of the country, that is slavery. That level of sexism and racism has been a part of this country's core and we're still trying to get past it. <clears throat> the second artist I wanna talk about is Karen Sneferu. 
Karen Sinifero was born in 1960. She's a self-taught artist and an English professor from Oakland, California. She grew up in the 1970s and describes this period of Black feminism to address the issues of class, sexism, and economical challenges, and questions the motives of white feminists. These Black women having to take care of these white women's children in the home, it brought into question, to what extent were these white women really interested in the feminist movement? And she questioned the, the goal and the rationale. She understood the rationale of the feminist movement, but she questioned the goal of, if we're all women, then why aren't we all being treated equally? How much really are you interested in pe women of color's issues and, pro and, and the concerns that they have? Karen believed a black feminist artist today is a woman who returns back to her African culture and reclaims herself from westernized imperialism and cultural views. She identifies as Africanist, which recognizes the importance of African aesthetics and a creative vehicle. She also talks about being an artist, and her husband's an artist as well. And she said that a lot of times people will walk right past her and go straight to her husband thinking that she's not the artist. And she goes, I've done more art shows than he has. Just to show that people did not look at her as even being an artist. In Karen's opinion, Black women are hungry for images of themselves. Afri Karen's African spirituality is a part of her artwork, and she believes it is important to incorporate what she identifies as make mythin. Myth, um, myth making allows for the community to be alive. That's what I learned as a Black female artist. I have the ability to create work which reveals our culture is not dead. Her whole goal was to create a series, uh, and, and doing this interview, because I'm going to show you some work that she's doing now, but during this time with this series uh, interview, she was doing techno and kisi, and she was combining technology with the African traditional art um, from the Congo. And she, thought, she created this because she said it was a place of healing, a place that historically has forced dehumanizing practices on the black woman's body as a place of culture of liberation. She stressed that the status quo attempts to move, remove the value, beauty, and purpose of the black woman in her community. So now, okay, Karen has created a movement called Black Woman is God in the Bay Area in California, where this is a virtual art show that asserts black women celebrating and building up their society and sustainable future. The project explored the intersectionality of race, age, and gender to dismantle stereotypes of black women. I'm just gonna show you just how it came about in the beginning stages of Black Women as God. Am I Exhale out. Again, deep breath in. You know, we just had this dialogue. What will it be? What will we talk about? What will we? What will we have on the walls that will be a subliminal message that sticks with you, right? So we had a conversation outside, and it, and it became the Black Woman is God, and here you are. And I also want us to be able to challenge some of the ideas about who we are as Black women, both in our communities and outside of our community. Yeah. And so we seal this knowing that it is already done, knowing that there is no way that all of these women could not gather in this room mm -hmm. and there not be ripples that will be felt mm -hmm. throughout the Bay Area, throughout this country, mm -hmm. throughout the world. Yes, our, yes. our sisters all around the world are feeling our presence right now. Yes. They don't even know yes. and that we are standing up because we are heeding a call that came deep within our wombs. Each and every one of us was called forward and we looked up and we found each other and we will continue to find our sisters and our brothers all throughout the world yes. knowing that we are the ones we've been waiting for. Oh, yes. 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 Ah! 
And Karen's whole purpose was to create a space because she felt that there was not a space, especially on the West Coast, that was able to mold Black women artists. The next artist I want to go over is Bisa Butler. Bisa Butler was born in 1974 in Orange, New Jersey, and she received her BA in studio art in, from Howard University and a master's of art education from Montclair State University in Montclair, New Jersey. She is a former high school teacher that's, that lives in um, New Jersey. Uh, she talked about the black feminist movement of stories that she had heard about of oppression of black women from her grandmother, from her aunt, and from her mother. And she said she doesn't really identify with the black feminist movement that's from the 70s that's based on marches and protests. But she believed that the Black feminist art movement is still here, but through social media. Okay. On Instagram, more so because I see a lot of imagery and I feel the Black art feminist movement, I would say, is stronger than it was before. And what I liked about her statement, when I interviewed other women who were around, who were part of the, the feminist art movement, had a different perspective than someone who was younger who felt that, yeah, the feminist art movement, the black feminist art movement is here through social media. And she Bisa felt that this was a platform for black women today to show their artwork. Bisa considered herself a black activist concerned with the continuous fight within the entire black community for equality. At the time of the interview, Bisa attempted to show her work to mainstream galleries and museums, but she did not receive any response back. Similar to Karen, Bisa also talked about people would walk up to her husband and speak to her husband, assuming he was the artist and ignoring her presence there. She said she believes that people would put her down because of her gender and they would not have done it if, it, if she was a male. She identifies her artwork from her African ancestry and located the meaning of her artwork. I feel maybe my direct ancestors worked on a plantation or as far back in Africa. Maybe my ancestors were the weavers, but the process for me is reclaiming of art. I'm going to read part of a quote um, in my interview that I had was with Bisa years ago, a couple years ago. And she said, my mother sold, my grandmother sold, but they weren't, they weren't quilt makers. They were both seamstress. And I feel like American society sort of pushes people, especially black people and black women to forget what it is, who we are and what we really are and what we do best. I feel by me using this medium, it kind of came to me by the way. I just took a quilting class connected to me to a deeper level. I realized I found my medium. I needed it at the time. I was pregnant, the smell of oil paint and linseed were making me very sick. And my grandmother was sick also. So I decided to make a quilt for her to connect her to me on an emotional level because I wanted to. I made a quilt in class. It was a portrait. So I decided to make that for my grandmother. Everybody made such a big deal about it. I can't believe you made this out of the cloth. The cloth your mother gave you. She was ill at the time. I was very happy. She, she could be proud of me and see how much I loved her. And I also needed to comfort him with all the fabric of her clothing she had given me through the years. She sold so much that she would give me her leftovers and putting those things into quilt were comforting to me. I had a piece of her. Quilting connected me to my ancestors, whereas painting just wouldn't for me. I'd like to show you now, share with you an interview that she did explain her process. I feel like my work is telling the true story of the people. Think about people who maybe have not been recognized traditionally. Who is this person? What was their personality like? What was their life like? I feel like I'm telling a story from the inside point of view. What is it like as me? 
My name is Lisa Butler. I'm an artist. I work primarily in textiles. This came about because I was in school and I was studying painting. My grandmother was ill and I made a portrait for her. And when I finished the painting, I, I turned it around and I was like, Grandma, what do you think? And her face kind of fell. I was really crushed because I was like, oh my God, but this is the way I saw her. And I talked it over with my aunt and my mother. And my aunt said, your grandmother sees herself as 30 years younger than what she is. So I was like, what if I made like a portrait quilt? I, I gave it to her and she loved it. I could feel like some energy in the room that something new was happening. The initial start is, who is it going to be? And then after you choose that person, choose your color scheme. And the color scheme is based on what you feel about that person. People have color around them, in them, that is not evidently visible to the naked eye. After all of that, that sort of internal process, then I actually have to start sketching. And then that sketch is what I use to cut all those little bits of fabric up. I don't use any computer programs because I feel like my sketch is my impression of this person. After I've laid out everything, then I get to the sewing. Although it looks intimidating, it's actually the fastest part. Considering the 300 hours would be something that took me maybe a month to put together, then one day of sewing is like, I feel like I'm on this amazing roller coaster when I'm stitching. A piece that I just finished is of Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass has always been like a larger than life figure. And I became intrigued, like what kind of man is this? That at 30 years old, you have this presence of self that's sort of emanating outside of this photograph. I suppose we all are interested in the human condition and what is it that people can do and what is somebody else seeing that maybe you didn't see before. So I think it's very important for every artist to like accept themselves as imperfect and accept their sketch as an impression of their subject. I feel okay. So Lisa now has no problem with her artwork being shown. She has gallery representation and now her artwork is being shown all over the world. And she has recently um, did the cover for Time Magazine in March 2020 and their 100 Women of the Year series. And she did a portrait of Nobel Peace Prize Wangari Mathai, who was the first woman in Central and East Africa to earn a PhD and is the founder of the Greenbelt Movement. Which, deal, which is the grassroots um, environmental movement and community development in Kenya. Okay. I'm gonna show you another artist. And I know afterwards we have more time to go into depth, but I just wanna be able to show all the artists. Laura James is in her 40s at the time of the interview I did in 2015. She is a self-taught artist and illustrator and is currently living in the Bronx. She is a professional illustrator for over 20 years, and she's originally known for her religious art, even though she does do women's artwork as well, talking about different forms of um, rights for women in the community. She says she wouldn't call herself actually a, a, a Black feminist, but she says she wouldn't say that she wasn't one. She admits the question is difficult to answer because she works in isolated, isolation. It's not really part of a community. Okay, it's very. When I asked her before going to court, the the quote about showing her work and, and trying to get into mainstream galleries and museums, and she said it is very difficult to be an artist, no matter who you are. I do believe that to get back to get to the museums to be successful as a black woman, it might be more challenging because they don't have opportunities to go through the channel that one needs to, to go to be gone through. If you can find a way to do this as a black woman, more power to you. You, If you're on the outside, it's going to be very difficult for you. If you get into galleries and museums without connections, they are lying to you. It doesn't happen. So her whole point was you need a network. You need some type of support network to help you get into that, into the, 
the art world. And any black woman that says, oh, she just does it by herself, she goes, no, that's not possible for you just, for you just to do by yourself. After living in the Bronx, she realized that she did not really know any artists. She was originally born in, and raised in Brooklyn. So she felt isolated in the Bronx. She, so she started the Bronx 200, which is a Bronx visual art directory. It's an online database to show um, the Bronx visual artists. And her project was a collaboration of over 200 Bronx artists and organizations in its effort to promote the arts and the cultures and being an artist and, create, and a creator in the Bronx today. And so this is one of the things that she created because she said, there's a need for that. Where, where do you get your support system from? Who do you network with if you're in an environment where you don't know anyone else? This is one of her paintings, Paint and Portrait as Frida Kahlo. And she said that she deliberately has her back to the audience. She explained that this painting speaks of, the, of her feminist side and feels society is caught up on facial features. She hopes through her self-portrait that the sexist view of what beauty is becomes irrelevant. To be told you are beautiful is nice, but what does it really matter? A pretty face is not really important or unique. There are other ways to show that. I'm going to play some of this interview that she had. I'm not going to play all of it because it's 15 minutes, but I'm going to play a couple of minutes of it just to get an introduction of her work that she had, what, what her inspiration was, and what created her and, and had her, her inspiration to become an artist. This is a book called Guru. I believe it's from Holland. And when I got this in the mail, I was I, I saw this is an image that I did, and I could not even look at this. I went straight to this picture because this is our Jesus that we used to have hanging in our living room throughout my childhood. And I was really um, I don't know. I was just it touched me. That that these two pictures are here together in this book. And I don't know what the book is about, but it was, um, I don't know, it just made me feel, um, you know, that I was glad that I continued to do this work. <laughs> so, Laura, we've been looking at some of your artwork and uh, talking about the different themes that you've explored over the years. And I think... Um, one type of imagery that people most readily recognize you for is your religious artwork, your religious representations. So um, tell us, why, why paint religious art? Well, well, I grew up going to church with my family, and um, you know, we went a lot. We went to morning service, church on Monday, church on Wednesday. So, you know, I was a young person and I was not always interested in listening to the pastor. And I would look at my Bible, my children's Bible, and it was filled with pictures. Lots of pictures. Uh, there were no pictures on our church walls because, you know, they didn't believe in uh, showing images of uh, biblical people in the church. But then again, we did have you know, books. We had the Bible, and I had this children's book in my house, which, um, you know, it, it was, it not only was it racially biased, but it was actually, like, overtly racist, I think, yes. even though I didn't really realize that then, but, you know, you can see that the black people are actually represented as, you know, they look kind of ape-like, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not cool. <laughs> so... You know, it was a, why did I paint religious art? Well, because I also like to paint stories. I like to tell stories and the Bible school stories. So, um, one, one day when I was walking in my neighborhood, I guess I was about 18 or so, and bed sky, I saw this book in the window of the store, Ethiopian Magic Scrolls. And um, it just captivated me, this picture, you know, it was, it, it's like it just shown on this very busy street, and so I bought this book. And I didn't really do art at the time. I was I was into taking photographs, but I looked at it and I said, you know, I think I could do this <laughs> because it's like outlined with black lines. I figured, you know, it's kind of like a comic book kind of thing. I could I could do this. So I 
you know, look through the book and I started to do my own angels and the different stories and, and I just kept doing it. And so I guess practice makes perfect, you know, and God given talent as well. That's I right. definitely appreciate my God given talent. So, and what about the images in the book did you find kind of most um, impressive? They well, made an impression on you. You know, I think it's the eyes, actually, the eyes. You know, they just kind of draw you in. And, you know, the, these angels in particular, this is called Nine Angels, and they're just looking at you from all angles, you know, and you just feel very calm, you know, just, you know. It's a very peaceful kind of imagery, I think, and very simple. It's not, you know, there's not a whole lot going on, and, you know, it's easy to understand as well. So it was just very simple and colorful, and honestly, I can remember the day like it was yesterday. It was such a beautiful day, and it was like the sun was shining. I was walking down the street with my friend, and I turned my head, and I saw this book. I was like, wow, what's that? You know, so it definitely made an impression. Well, other things must have made an impression on you as well because you not only paint religious art, but there are other themes that you can explore. I've seen the work we've done a lot of portraits or um, yeah, you tell stories. And yes, yes. stories in particular. What well, other influences could you point to? I suppose my family in general, you know, my mother and my sisters. I grew up with uh, seven sisters, so there were a lot of women in the house. So um, that was definitely an influence. And, you know, growing up in Bed-Stuy, a very Caribbean neighborhood, and my family from Antigua, you know, I, you know, I never really thought of myself as American at all, even though I was born in Brooklyn, you know, but it's just... You know, Caribbean food, Caribbean culture, and then also with, with the church aspect of it too, you know, because my family is very religious. So, um, just everything all together. You know, I, I also like to go out and to look at people, to go to see art exhibits and things like this. But there's just, you know, people, you know, just like people walking in the street or sitting and, you know, not really doing anything. I, I just like shapes and just, you know, I, I just like to, you know. So this one just show you a little bit about Laura James uh, before I go into Danielle Scott. And just talk about, you know, just look at her artwork and her inspiration. Uh, again, she, she started off as being intrigued by religious art, but she does so much more um, about women and families and culture. Now, Daniel Scott, I added her. I did not interview her. She was not part of my original series that I, I interviewed. But I met Daniel Scott years ago when she was still a high school student doing artwork. And I was a judge for a high school art competition. And I added her to this presentation because she is doing artwork that talks to what's happening now as it relates to um, COVID-19, as it relates to Black Lives Matter and injustices that we are facing today. So I thought that she would be a great addition to look at, to talk about. She is from um, Jersey City um, and she went to arts high school in Newark, New Jersey. She considered herself a mixed media assemblage artist. And she uses photo montage, found objects, raw materials, collages, anything that she can find to, to create her artwork. She identifies herself as a soft-spoken woman She's a mother of three, educated and self-lesbian. She says that she's Afro-Cuban, Polish Jew, Filipino in America. And I quote, as a visual artist, I choose to explore and connect intertwining relationships between social justice, equality, human rights and women's rights, brutality, femininity, modern day slavery and culture. I use my art as a conduit for bold, fearless, thought-provoking, unapologetic issues. And I'm going to show a little clip of her interview and how she describes her art-making process. Hi, my name is Danielle Scott, and welcome to my studio. First, I would like to thank the Visual Arts Center of New Jersey and curator Sarah Walco for inviting me to be a part of the Cabin of Fever Artist Talk series. I'm going to share with you a few pieces from my new series called Surviving Brown in America and answer some questions, questions about my process. What 
Lovelace expressing the story, pains and power of brown people in America, so important to you? Um, Nina Simone said it best, and her quote was, an artist's duty, as far as who's concerned, is to reflect the times. Artists are known as storytellers, and at this point in my career as an artist, I feel it is my duty to talk about America's dark past because it relates to what's going on in the world today. A lot of things have happened over the last couple of months that have sparked um, protest and the voices, the unheard voices of brown people in America to be heard. What has been your creative process during the COVID pandemic? Started off very slow during COVID, but um, you can't help but be on social media during COVID. You're home, you're not working. And the more and more that I was on social media or the more and more that I heard the news of things that have happened, um, the killing of George Floyd, the killing of Breonna Taylor and of Ahmaud Aubrey, I was able to sit and process um, this new series. And a lot of it comes from, one, the cop killings, and also the strange occurrence of hangings of people in America from California to now the youngest, a teenager in New Jersey. And finally, what makes you an artist? Um, what makes me an artist? Um, I can't be anything else. I've learned that. That I need to share with the world what's going on through my art. And I have learned to have no boundaries when I do that. Um, it can't just be me creating work that's pretty or me creating work that's going to sell. Um, in my heart, I need to create work that's going to be thought-provoking it's going to make you question, and I'm also going to uh, put it in your face that this is reality. This is happening today, and everyone needs to think about it, and we need to teach the stories, or we need to teach the truth of what's happening, and artists are starting to do that. Artists are starting to tell the truth of their story, and their story of being brown in America. So these are two more of Daniel Scott's work. And the first one here is called Pantsuit Nation. And she says she created this piece when Trump passed a travel ban in 2017 in order to, to restrict the travel from several um, Muslim countries. And I quote, that is when I had to say, this country doesn't stand for in liberty and justice for all. We're, we are under one God. She said this piece was also created to reference Trump having an issue with the hijab being worn, which is part of the Muslim religion and values. And the second piece here, is this all we made of? This piece, she said, depicts the many children of color who feel like they're simply targets for walking out their door and walking around America. A lot of the artists, the black women artists I've talked to, talk to, and even part of this presentation, did not look always at the black feminist art movement as just protests and marches as it was in the 1970s. They are contemporary black women artists who are still facing the challenges of racism and sexism in the field, and they're still trying to challenge the gender norms of who is an artist, what is an, art, an artist. There are still few Black women artists in mainstream galleries and museums even today, and compared to Black men and to, and to white women. These women in this presentation are painting their truth. They're moving past the obstacles and boundaries of being an artist. There is a clear distinction that how Black female artists define themselves in their artwork. Black female artists still encounter racism and sexism and inequality in the career. 
The marginalization of black women, female in the mainstream galleries and museum is still a conversation that still needs to be had because we are still not represented equally as compared to our counterparts. Thank you. Okay. I guess at this time we'll open it up to questions. Feel free to jump in at any time. Okay, I'll ask a question. Okay. Uh, didn't want to interrupt any students that had questions first, but um, in, in all of your interviews and research, um, did you find, uh, like, what, were there any really strong common currents in, in the, the themes and discussions that you were having with these artists? Like, if, if you were to draw kind of the strongest through lines through your interviews, what do you think those connections were? There is underrepresentation of Black women in art. Regardless if they identify as feminist or not, that wasn't the issue. The issue was we're not visible. There's no place for us. And that was from, like I said, um, Janet was, you know, there during tour in the 70s, all the way to Daniel Scott, who was the infant. So during that transition of those years, not too much has really changed. Right. So, uh, hi. hi. Uh, so, what is something that we could do to help empower um, Black women's voices in the art movement? Well, there's several things. I think one of the things is asking to see their work in museums and galleries because um, they are there. And if someone tells you they can't find anyone, that's not true. There are black women artists who, who are here who are who are wanting to show their artwork. I mean, I'm one of them. <laughs> I mean, you want to show their artwork. So to say that no one is there, um, that system has to be challenged, that art is not just for white males. That's why the Guerrilla Girls started their, their campaign saying that in order to be a woman, I guess you had to be nude in order to get into the museum because that was how they, that, they were painting nude women. And now their whole point, like, what do we have to do to, to get there? We need more women curators of museums and galleries to say, hey, you know, this is, and even, even then there's not a lot, there's a few, and it's a compliment just to be a part of that, that world. Um, you know, talking more about black women artists, go to the, their, their shows, um, you know, I think the one thing is, to, is the recognition and having an equal recognition, not showing, like I said, not showing the same person over and over and over again, because that defeats the issue of what equality is. And buying their artwork. <laughs> <laughs> buying their artwork, that, 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 that helps. <laughs> Now, let me ask you, have any of you heard of these women before? No, ma'am. Okay. And that was the whole point of why I selected them. Um, I showed with Bisa Butler, I've shown with Janet um, Pickett, um, and I selected for, I didn't show with Laura, and again, I knew Daniel when she was in high school, a high school student. So, um, and that's why I felt that, that let me show women, contemporary women who are working today that are not in the museums, who are not in the textbooks. You know, one of the things I will talk about is, you know, when I taught art history to my high school students, 
there may be three or four black people in the whole book and one may be a black woman. And I said, there's, I have, there's an issue with this because <laughs> we do exist. So. One of the things we've been talking about in art history is um, just the, the overwhelming amount of writing from Western white men. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been doing work as a class to repair the canon. Um, but I'm wondering if you have anyone, um, any writing that you recommend, any readings that, that we can share? Uh, I'm going to say art historian Lisa Ferriton. And she has written two books. One is just exclusive of Black women artists. And she has another one that I, I used in one of my classes I taught at Penn State of uh, African-American art, where she starts from um, slavery all the way into contemporary artists that we've always been doing art. It's not, it's not new. So she's art. Uh, another art historian, Lisa Collins, talks about Black women artwork, but as far as the Black body and how we show the Black body, and it should not be something that is feared because when we look at artwork by white men, they show new black, I mean, new white women. So why, why is the black body, this is just as beautiful as theirs in artwork. You, you mentioned that Janet Pickett had been at this since the 70s, and uh, it, take a lot, it takes a lot of energy, particularly if you're underrepresented, to continue going on. Yes. What was it about her that contributed to that resiliency? Um, well, art has always been her passion, and that's something that she loved to do, but she felt, you know, why should she not be able to do her artwork because of her race and her gender? She received a BFA, MFA. So this is her, her life. This is her life work. And she taught at Essex County Community College for 35 years. And she talks about the sexism that she dealt with, that, you know, she was paid less than um, the male, whether it was black or white, she was paid less than them, even though she had more experience. But one thing she had was, there was in Newark, New Jersey at that time, she had a, a strong support network that helped her. And she was, a, she had a child. Um, she became a divorcee. She did with Tom. She had, she had to bring her daughter to the studio with her because she had no one to take to watch her. So she brought her daughter with her, packed her lunch and brought her with her. So it's just that not giving up and having a support community. And that, that, that was the whole question I started off with this project because I felt that I didn't have a, a support community, a supportive community. And I said, well, at one point, there was something called the Black Feminist Movement. Well, what happened to that? You know? So I know in the 70s and the early 80s, there, there was more of, of a connection, more of a supportive network for women of color um, to just communicate with one another and talk about what it means to be an artist and what, where do you go now from here? I have another question. Yeah. So you, you mentioned earlier, um, and a couple of the artists mentioned the, the significance of, of social media mm -hmm. now in terms of, of its, its strength in, in building a network in a community. Can you speak a little bit to that in terms of um, how artists are using uh, kind of these new platforms mm -hmm. to, to facilitate that? Well, yes. When Bisa said that, we were, we were comparing the, black, the visibility of a black feminist movement, where in the 70s, women were marching, they were standing, they were protesting in front of uh, museums, like Faith Ringo had started, with signs up saying, and she was saying, for her right now, that's not what she, that's not how she sees black feminist movement. She sees black feminist movement as through social media, but that's a, a broader platform now to voice yourself instead of marching in the streets and um, so forth. So social media is, is huge. It's for huge for everyone. I mean, I have a website. I have an Instagram page. I mean, it's, 
it's a way now to um, show your artwork. It's easier. It gets out a qu quicker. Uh, so social media for Bisa was saying that this is, for her, a new movement because this is what people are using now. Let me ask you a question. Was, it, was there any artist out of the four women that stood out to you? I know it went, went through them. I wanted to give you little snippets. But was, was it someone that the artwork and style actually stood out to you? Um, I'll go first. Um, okay. I mean, because they were all amazing. So I want to thank you for, for all of these artists because well, they're, they're fantastic work. Um, I looked up several of them as we were coming, um, uh, speaking to the power of the internet here. Um, Danielle Scott's work is really, uh, was really impressive and, and the kind of the variety of media and imagery was really, really interesting. And um, Bisa Butler, like the, um, the kind of textiles and fibers she was working with and the kind of color palettes and the, the intricacy of the images were really powerful. Okay. And you know, one thing about with Visa when I was speaking with her, she said, you know, she said, you like people use oil paints to paint. She said, I use my fabric to paint. Mm -hmm. And at first people was not enthused about that. She said she was difficult at first. Uh, especially some of her class professors to accept this as her medium because they were traditional oil, you know, painters. And they was like, they just couldn't, couldn't see, this is not a painting. She goes, but it is. I'm just using fabric instead of oil or watercolor. So she said she had a little struggle. She wasn't trying to convince people to accept it. This is what she was doing. She was, you know, challenging the norms of an artist and a painter by saying, no, I'm going to stick to it. And now, again, she's on the Time magazine. Her artwork is all over. She's, and do, she's doing this full time now. So, and she now has gallery representation. And that's why I wanted to clarify. At the time of the interview, she didn't. She was still teaching high school. But now her work is being accepted because it is so unique. It, no one else is doing this in the way that she is as a portrait. People are doing quilts. But this is, these are quilt, these are paintings for her. Not quilts you throw on the bed or hang up. These are, these are paintings for her. Did some of the artists that you talked with um, and interviewed have anything to say about how some of the materials are so often gendered? Like we would think, or so many people would think of um, textile work as being like feminine in some way. And was that, was that something that came up? And if so, what did they have to say about no. it? Not really. I know Janet, she was inspired by Matisse. Um, so she used a lot of his style, but no one really gendered their, the medium that they used. Uh, I know that uh, Danielle has, and one, one thing I did like was the Pantsuit Nation, where there was a doll. And she has another piece I didn't show where there's panties up. It's representing the flag. So she does but it's for a message. So she does that sometimes because of the work that she's doing. Um, but just in general, no, no one felt, no one was genderizing their medium. Any other questions or comments? I guess not. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, uh, Dr. Bailey, thank you so much. I, I think it was very insightful. And um, like I said, hopefully some of the students are time shifting this and are going to pick it up on the YouTube channel. So, uh, except they don't get to ask the cool questions. So, uh, <laughs> Well, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm glad I, have a, I had an opportunity to, to share with you new artists that you have not heard about before. 
Um, Because that's the whole purpose of letting you know that there are, you know, outside the textbooks that you have, there are more women out there, more women of color out there who are showing their artwork. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and, uh, it's interesting you cited the Gorilla Girls because um, about five years ago, they had this lecture. Okay. (laughs) So, good company. Yeah. (laughs) Thanks again. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.